Hey, welcome everyone to another episode of Making Ideas Work. We're joined um, by the fabulous C. Todd Lombardo. C. Todd, I looked at your LinkedIn just before we joined on the call and it said here, I'm going to read this out, data nerd, design geek, product fanatic, product guy who believes product is not the right fit for today's data-driven exponential world. Tell me what that really means. Bring it to life for me. How do we understand who you really are and what you, you know, what you do? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. It's great to be here. Um, when I think about that, that statement and the reason why I made it is that product implies a, a physical object. And I'm, you know, for, for those listening, I'm like holding something in my hand. It's actually a little AirPod case. Product oftentimes applies something physically you can touch with your hands. And that's, I think, historically what we used to consider products. But today, digital products go beyond just the physical product itself. It's the whole use of the product from before you even get to it, when you actually interact with it, and even after you interact, what the impact it made in your life. So sometimes I'm, I'm not convinced that the word product is the right thing, that the right phrase, the right word we should be using when it comes to, to that, because it is about experiences. And I don't even know if experiences is the right word either, but um, it definitely goes much more to an ex experiential element than the product itself. Um, so that's where I, that's probably where I, I'm probably seen in my LinkedIn, I, I bridge design and product, and that's intentional because I think they, they really go well together. Yeah, super interesting. In fact, I, I came across this, uh, I think what you're talking about here really explicitly very, uh, very recently, I was doing some work with major global financial services organization. They consider products to be their loans and their financial vehicles that they essentially sell to customers. But I was there in the capacity of thinking about digital products, which they mm -hmm. don't consider products. And therefore that kind of language and the terminology just kind of threw up something completely different for us. And, and we were so misaligned because we were, we were talking about different things, but using the similar kind of terminology. And actually, yeah. probably just one example, I guess, of where we get slightly stuck with this idea of product, I guess, as well. Yeah, and I had the same experience when I was at OpenLay, an insure tech startup. Product in an insurance world is the insurance policy that you sell. And that they had a whole chief product officer and they have a whole like product group. And the thing is, when you when you sort of unpack, like, what is a product group at an insurance company? Well, they're mostly actuarials and it's all the actuarial science that goes into making an insurance product, which effectively, in a sense, it is. And, you know, they hired me to help build out. We call it a product experience team. So we actually had to rename things internally in the company of, yeah, this is the insurance product group and this is the product experience group. And the product experience is mostly digital uh, side of things that probably we're most used to in our our spheres, but product can mean a lot of different things. And so there's another example of how the word product doesn't always fit right. It could be really interesting to hear, I guess, your journey to kind of where you are now. I see you very much as, you know, a product person, whatever that means, but you're really focusing about uh, user experiences. Uh, maybe multiple dimensional user experiences, maybe on and offline things potentially and those kinds of things as well. But I'd love to hear, because I, you know, I get asked this question myself, like, well, what did you do that led you towards this position? I'm like, oh goodness, how do we fit all these different building blocks together yeah. to make sense of it in an easy way? I'd it's, love to not <laughs> <laughs> right. it's not a straight line. It's not a straight line. And I don't know many people who it ever is. So. I started out studying science. I love science, still do. Um, you know, really fascinated by by human biology. In fact, a lot of my professors when I was an undergrad were like, "Where are you going to medical school?" And I was like, "I don't know if I want to go to medical school." <laughs> um, and, but I went to graduate school. Uh, started out as a as a chemistry PhD. Um, chemistry was just really easy for me. I just I conceptually I understood it. I could look at a whiteboard or blackboard and see formulas, and it just it just intuitively made sense um and i was for fortunate that i was kind of good at it and i was good at it you go like oh cool i kind of like this um and you think about where chemistry touches and it's like a lot of places <laughs> right today it, we don't necessarily think about it at the top of mind but it's kind of everywhere in our lives uh, we just don't necessarily realize it so anyway started out as a phd uh in chemistry <laughs> and after about a year, I dropped out in, uh, uh, of a PhD chemistry program and went into biomedical engineering, which to me was 
the beginnings of where I, how I landed in, in product truly, because when you think about biomedical and engineering, you've got to understand the biology. It's very systems thinking. You've got to understand the biology, maybe the biochemistry. You've got to understand uh, electrical engineering enough, but you're not an expert. You got to understand mechanical engineering enough, but you're not an expert. Um, and so all of these things, you have to understand enough to, to know how they work together as a system, but you're really not an expert in any single one of them. And oftentimes you're working with others who are experts in those things. Does that sound kind of like a product manager, <laughs> right? You're not the designer, the expert in the design. You're not the expert in the engineering. You're not the expert in sales or marketing, uh, but you've got to work uh, with the whole system, right? So started doing that. And um, after I left, started working at, initially as an engineer, a research engineer at a biotech company. And through a couple of M&As that that company ended up doing, uh, I found myself at a place where the product manager had left the product that I was working on. And um, I was do a lot of sales marketing and the rest of the company started coming to me for, for answers on things. And so I just started to have to do a fair amount of that. I didn't have to get into like the, the planning for the next, like doing any of the requirements gathering or all the, the things that a product manager, you know, classically does. Um, but it was more along the lines of just coordination, alignment, communication across an organization. And um, one of the sales reps said to me, how come you're not the product manager? Cause you know, you're kind of doing half of Robin's job. And I was like, and Robin was the one woman who left. And I thought, huh, interesting. Uh, so I went to Robin's former boss and I said, Hey, should I be the product manager here? I'm kind of doing half her job. And he looks at me and he's like, yeah, you're right. You are. And he's like, yeah, well, let me think about that. And then, so the next day he's like, oh yeah, let's get you into the interview cycle. And you know, did the rounds. And the next thing I know I had the title product manager and I was like, okay, rich, but I don't know what I'm doing. I've never been a product manager before. And he's like, don't worry. Wait, wait, wait. I was the same thing. I was a biomedical engineer and nobody like, I, it's like, I'll teach you everything you need to know. Great. Awesome. Super excited. Uh, four weeks later, Rich is asked to leave the company because of some restructuring elements. And he was, they were asking him to relocate from where he was in Connecticut to Boston. Just, anyways. So he refused to, to move up to Boston from his Connecticut office. I think he had his, you know, teenagers in high school, etc. He just, he wasn't moving. Um, and, uh, so he was asked to leave the company. I was like, oh crap, what? I, I don't have anybody teaching me what to do anymore. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of it was, was just learned by f a lot of failure, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, I had this task of, there was a product that was released. So in, in that product manager's absence, there was a product that got shipped basically because the VP of sales saw like three or four orders on the books. Now this was a, a big instrumentation product. It was maybe about three to four, three to 500,000, 300 to $500,000 in, in a price tag. Uh, plus it had a, re, a reagent, renewable reagent stream along with it. So, you know, not only was it a piece of hardware that got sold, there was a software license and then there was um, sort of chemistry and biology reagents that would be like renewables. Um, so obviously a VP of sales looking at this saying, why is this on the books? How can we haven't shipped it? Um, puts pressure on the VP of engineering. Hey, is this product ready to go? Why don't we ship it? No, no product manager was there to say yes or no. <laughs> and they just shipped. It. So you put like five of these out into the world. I inherited it like uh, a few months later once I joined um, the PM team. And uh, <laughs> I had to basically like, I was like, what do I do with this thing? And it was, it was, you know, barely even an alpha, quite frankly, but uh, there was a number of bad tech companies that wanted it and wanted the promise of what it what it offered. And it kind of half worked. That was the problem. The technology wasn't fully, fully refined yet. Uh, so I basically had to go on this journey of pulling a product off the market as one of my first product management. Now I'm thinking about most product managers are like, understand the customer's needs, put the requirements together, create, create the right, um, you know, communication and alignment artifacts to get engineering and design to, you know, make the product and ship it. Right. And then understand what the, the future iteration need to be. But I did that in complete opposite. I was like, Whoa, this thing's a mess. And I, I had to do this. Like it took me like a year. Well, it took me a good six months to figure out just what was going on. 
And then another like three or four months to be like, oh my God, I have to pull this thing off the market. And then another three months to like figure out an exit strategy to pull it back and get alignment from everybody. Because it basically came down to we were losing, losing a million dollars in cash a year on support, travel and, and replacement part costs. And once we, once I was able to pull that together as a business case and say, look, I understand we have, you know, this kind of revenue, but right now we're losing, we lost a million dollars last year on trying to keep these six basically alpha units in our customers' hands and working to our customers' liking. I was like, this isn't a good business decision. Like we, we can't sell another 25 of these and be profitable. This is, there's not going to be an economy of scaling. We can't even get these to work. Um, how the rest going to work. So it was a really interesting, um, you know, trial by fire first year to, you know, year to two years of product management. Cause I also had another product that did this, you know, sort of typical, like it was going out, it was fine. It was the one that I had been working on, um, that ultimately got killed from an acquisition. Uh, we acquired a company that had a competing product. And so they were like, yeah, this product is getting, uh, is getting sunset. So it was a very, it was a very odd, chaotic time. But that was my first instance in product management. And um, then from there, it was, you know, because there was a lot of M&A in the biotech space, um, some of it was voluntarily moving, but a lot of it was just like, oh, we just got acquired by this company. You're, you're now, work, you now work here. Um, and one thing I didn't realize, there wasn't uh, a lot of design as a discipline in these biotech companies. And so I was tasked with, hey, what's the UI look like? And I didn't know there was, at the time, a dedicated discipline around this. I was, I was like, okay. Uh, and then somebody at someone was like, oh, you're in charge of the GUI. I'm like, the what? The like graphical <laughs> user interface. And I was like, okay, I'm totally dating myself with that term, I'm sure. Uh, and then, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> So anyways, uh, we're at, you know, sort of, uh, you know, in another, another company, I'm, I'm sort of responsible for this and I'm designing these, these GUI interfaces, um, thinking that it's a product manager's job, not realizing. And somebody tell, told me like, oh yeah, there's a, there's a whole design discipline here. And I was like, huh? There's a lot of self-education, like, hey, let me learn about this. Let me, let me understand this so I can make something halfway decent so the customers can use it. And a lot of times when you're selling into biotech spaces, you're selling to a very highly technical audience, often PhD master's level, um, that, that are very technical in nature, but still they're human beings. They need to be able to get something done because they want to focus on the analysis or the output of the, the, the machine versus um, like how to actually operate it, right? So how do you make the operation easy so that they can do their, their analysis and use their brains and training for what it's really, really meant to do. So I uh, kind of did this like mix of both for, for a long time, even though my title was mostly product manager. Um, I was just doing these, in, you know, visual basic, you know, <laughs> I was doing the visual basic front ends. They were doing this, you know, C++ back ends. Um, it was, it was an interesting time, but that's kind of how I got this mix of design and and product because to me it was kind of the same. So, uh, yeah, that's sort of how I got, it. I got into all this. And then over the last decade or so, it's been a mix of design and product roles in inside and outside. It's been, it's been fun. Um, yeah. Amazing. Uh, th I think, you know, I think there's probably a lot of parallels for people. Like probably most people's journey is quite different, but there's so many different things that you talked about that definitely were resonating with me and I'm sure would, would do with a lot of people as well. You know, I started off in an engineering capacity, uh, being really obsessed with mechanical engineering. And that's the route that I was going for my major and then realized actually there's this other world. And when I really understood what that route, where that route was going to lead me, then actually there was this other world of using more creative kind of side mm -hmm. of my uh, really and, and, and knitting in with the engineering and the kind of scientific approaches and whatever else, but from a more of a creative perspective, I think uh, that's kind of where I went to. And then also, yeah, like landing, um, free falling almost <laughs> into a product role, trying to figure out what all these things are and picking up a bit of design here and a bit of kind of product management side yeah. of things. And also the business context being so important as well. Like the, the story that you described just there, highlighting that enormous decision that you basically had to had to make but also had to convince people of yeah. was based on a, a business driving yep. factor right this is losing us money this is hurt, hurting us hard 
And sometimes I think there's that maybe lack of understanding or appreciation of the importance of the of the business uh, objective. Oh yeah, and I had I had no training in business at that point, right? I was like clueless. I I, I mean, I was a science and engineering you know, scholastically trained person, I had, I was like, business? What? I don't know. And it wasn't until I got in there and, and started to realize like, wait, how is this? And the, because my boss basically had left, left the company, I really didn't have a direct boss. I mean, it was like reporting to the SVP of sales, I think. And he, you know, the, our product line, my product line was like maybe five to six million total annual. Um, and he was responsible for like, I don't know, all, 150, 200 million dollars of revenue. So for me, he was like, he didn't care. It was like, as long as you, you know, don't lose the five million, we're good. Like whatever. Like, right. and he was all about top line, right? Because he was the VP of sales. I, I had maybe you know half an hour of his time once a quarter. So he didn't. <laughs> I was not a, a priority for him at all. <laughs> but it also taught me that I had to put things in language that he could understand, and some of his peers could. I was like, hey. There's dollars and cents here that we can't, we're, we're going to lose a lot of. So, yeah. 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 Amazing. Hey, um, I'm, I'm super keen. I want to, I want to kind of dig into those two elements. If you like, as you, yeah. you were talking there a bit about product and a bit about design and, yeah. you know, this show is very much intended to kind of, well, I guess do what it says on the tin, really. It's understand and learn from people that have made and are making ideas that really work. And whilst we don't, I don't think it's about separating these kind of two or three different areas, but I'm really interested to dig into the making of ideas, the coming up with with new things. Maybe we can touch on things around the, the book that you wrote, Design Sprint, with that and sure. kind of understand and unpick some of those things. And then I guess the second part maybe is like making them work, making them real, making them tangible, but also making them so that they do capture and create value for you as an organization or as a, as a business and yep. also for your for your uh, for your users customers maybe even the kind of wider system at play as well so mm. i'd love to hear firstly if it's okay to hear a little bit about the book design sprint i've got it yeah. right here yeah um, and you know how that came about why you chose to write it and i know that there's probably a story in there as well about the timing oh, yeah. and whatever else so yeah. i'd love to kind of unpick that and get into um yeah sure. into how that came about sure um so how that came about um, in like 2011 ish or so um, I was asked to teach a um, like I was given at an MBA program where I teach in Spain. I was given a week of a module between two, uh, two terms and they said, Hey, how do we teach, you know, your, your designer. Um, and I, I went to this school as an MBA grad and I said, Hey, there's not a lot of design thinking here. Can we do something? And I proposed a course and they said, sure. And so I think after a year of teaching that course, they're like, Hey, there's this space in between. Usually they, they give, gave the students like a week break between the, um, the terms. And then they would do this like other like challenge week, they called it. Um, and it, uh, offered a variety of different things. And over the years they experimented with different formats and the, the Dean of program said, see Todd, why don't you, why don't you come up with a design challenge week? And so I was like, cool. Um, and I started doing, and I was like, all right, I had somebody in like 2008 or 2007, whenever this came out, like Stanford's D school bootcamp. Um, I just remember like seeing like this, it was like, a. I don't know, it looked like it was a photocopy of a cassette tape or something. And it was, uh, it was a you know, recipe book of all these design exercises. And I was like, this is awesome. Uh, this is so cool. And I was like, I was totally ate it up. And um, I found that super helpful. So I was like, great, could we, could I, you know, package something like this for the, the business school students? And I knew that uh, Stanford had their, their format of five phases. So I was like, hey, what if we just do a phase a day and teach this, right? So I started teaching this. And the way they worked it was they would they would do the sort of challenge week, but then they always got a corporate sponsor. So the corporate sponsor, hey, work on this, have the students work on this project using this design thinking framework for us to come up with ideas and, and validate them, vet them, etc. So in terms of like creating ideas, so in a few a couple of years of sort of doing that, um, and I think you know, I think we did did a couple times a year. So we had uh, like with McDonald's with. Um, one of the, uh, I think it was Estrella, one of the, the beer companies in Spain with Iberia. So we had some really big, um, and it was fun to 
work with the students to have, teach them this design thinking approach, but also collaborate with a, with a company on a, on a real challenge. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And then I was coming back to the States and I was, um, I was going to be joining Constant Contact. Uh, they were start spinning up an innovation team and I was going to join them and, and help continue to spearhead that effort. There was like two people they had, they had started to do it. They are bringing me on as a third and we were going to merge with another team uh, to create a larger sort of in a small business innovation center. And I was out on a bike ride with uh, Richard Banfield. Do you know him? Yeah. I don't know Richard, no, no. Oh, yeah. Richard, uh, he was the founder of a design agency in the Boston area called Fresh Tilt Soil. And um, he's an avid cyclist like me. So we were out on a bike ride and I was telling him about, um, I'm going to be joining Constant Contact and uh, you know, design uh, the, the design and product community in Boston's, you know, fairly not too big, but not too small either. So kind of knew, knew that. And, and I said, yeah, I've got, you know, I've got this thing that I've been teaching at, uh, at IE and it's been working with some of these corporate clients. Um, and I've, I've got about a, you know, a Google doc with about, I don't know, 10,000 words of vomit on a page of how to teach people about this because I'm going to have to, you know, I've got some curriculum, right. But I also need to teach the, um, uh, the innovation center and the rest of constant contact, like how this, how this works and how they can use it to help create, um, products. So, <laughs> and, um, I think around the time, I think Jake Knapp and the Google ventures guys, they maybe had one post on design sprints is roughly 2011, 2012 timeframe. And, um, I said, yeah, I've got this. And I was like, I know there's that one post for this design sprint. Oh, that was the other thing. Um, somebody, once I had done a couple of those challenge weeks, somebody's like, oh yeah, this is a design sprint. I was like, what? Uh, and I'd never heard the term before. Uh, then I heard it was like design sprint, design squat, design, like uh, I heard like a whole bunch of different things termed here. Um, but design sprint was the one that seemed to stick, especially given like the sprint, the week approach, et cetera. Um, and yeah, so I said, you know, hey Richard, like there's not a lot of, a lot of material out there on the design sprint format itself. I'm like, there's some design thinking things, but there's nothing that's like really packaged that says, Hey, here's what to do. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Maybe we, you know, we, what, what should we do about that? I was like, I don't know. Maybe we should write a book. And he goes, yeah, yeah, we should. And instead of saying like, that's a stupid idea. He said, yeah, we should. And I was like, Oh, did I just agree to a book? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we were like, all right, do we self publish? Do we were like, none of us, neither one of us had authored anything before we, we, so I right, started looking at our options. Like, do we self publish? Do we go with a, a publishing house? What are the pros and cons of each? What let's, let's take that, you know, 10,000 words I had and expand on it to see something. And so then we actually took the design sprint framework itself and said, could we do like a writing sprint in a similar kind of fashion? Like let's go talk to a bunch of product and design folks, see what their needs are around this, see what their curiosities are you know, kind of do go through the phases of like, all right, if, if, if our prototype ultimately is a, is a book, right. What could we do to like, do some input, do some prototyping, do some writing, um, and come out with something at the end. And one of our other colleagues, Michael Connors, he's actually listed on the book. He was a former, um, he was a graphic designer who worked as a UX designer for, for Richard at Fresh Old Soil. And he said, oh yeah, um, well I can, I can lay everything out for you because he had tons of layout experience. So we basically mashed up a Google doc after interviewing some folks, came up with some prototypes and, and he put together in, in a nice layout in uh, Adobe InDesign. And then we went and shared them with a bunch of the folks we, we interviewed and said, Hey, what is it? What about this? How does this look? Does this, does this make sense to you, et cetera. Uh, and then we started shopping it around to a couple of publishers who we had uh, got connections to through our network. And we ended up um, sending it out to like four or five different publishing houses and within probably two or three days, we had two offers to, to publish from, from two, two um, publishing houses. And one of them was O'Reilly. And we had, Richard had a loose connection to one of some of the Google Ventures guys. It wasn't Jake, it was one of the other ones. Um, and in the process, we're like, yeah, hey, we're trying to do this thing. You guys want to collaborate? This would be really cool. Like, we kind of think there's something here. And we got this email back like, hey, do you guys have a publisher yet? What are you doing? We're like, not yet. We're talking a couple. And then dead silence. We never heard anything back from them. And, uh, so, you know, I think Richard pinged them a couple times, still no response. And we're like, huh, all right. So we were already starting to talk to a couple publishers and we had the offer to publish and we're like, well, let's do it. Um, we signed the contract and then maybe two or three months later, 
Google Ventures announces theirs and we're like, oh, and like they're gonna, they're gonna have their own version with this. And we're like, oh, Joe, that's why. So we're like, okay. And then we're like, oh God, I hope you don't write the same book. <laughs> So we have, our, our thought was to write like a cookbook, like, Hey, here's the, yeah. the whole recipe for the whole thing. Start to finish. You want to just peel out one piece. Cause I think the, the, the philosophical difference was that Google ventures was going in very much at a startup world. Like they were using this in startups and saying, Hey, this is going to help your startup accelerate your idea and move forward. We were coming at it from a more corporate level, like from my, my experience at uh, the business school with the corporate clients. Um, it was really hard to say, Hey, block off your calendar for, you know, eight hours a day for five days straight. They were like, are you kidding me? <laughs> no way. And even in constant contact, doing the same thing, like trying to get, um, people's time, that kind of time was really hard. So we had to try to experiment with ways that was actually really fun about the, the innovation centers. We had to experiment with a number of different formats to try and get this to work. So. Um, like, do we do it like one a day for four weeks? Like, you know, once a day for four or five weeks, right? Was that one? We tried that. We tried, you know, all right, Tuesday and Thursday mornings. Like we tried just a variety of different ways to, to make this happen. Um, still in a compressed time frame, but not, you know, five full days start to finish. Of course, when we got that, it was great. You get the attention, you get the, the, when you, you get the team focused. I mean, uh, part of, we, we joked that half the magic of the design strip was literally focusing on one area for five straight days. And that there's a lot of truth to that. Um, but also sometimes it's really hard to do that, especially in a, in a corporate world where you've got you know, a thousand more employees, you've got uh, a business that's already running that still has to continue to move forward. Um, and so, you know, we, it was fun experimenting with that, but philosophically, that's why we wrote it as more of a modular approach of like, Hey, do these as you need to. Um, your mileage may vary. Here are the different Lego pieces you can put together to, to make you whatever sprint you need for yourself. So that's kind of how we, we philosophically approach it. And thankfully, I think ours and theirs differed enough, but were complementary enough um, yeah. that we're, they weren't too overlapping. Yeah, it's, I think like my observation of the two, side by side, having not known that story, was pretty much exactly what you just described there, right? So um, I think when Sprint came along, it seemed to make a big splash, and particularly in the startup world, I was working as a startup at the time uh, in, in a product team. Um, and strangely enough, similar to, to what you had kind of experienced or talk, talked about there is, I created something that I call the Innovation Lab, which is like a three-day experience, pretty much kind of the same thing, a bunch of the same kind of tools, and uh, and that was one of the experiences that we'd, we'd created um, for that startup. Mm -hmm. And then this kind of came along and it went, all right, well, this is the way, this is the single way. And it was like, it, you do it in five days. It's very, very regimented. It's very structured. You have to do this voting thing with this exercise and blah, 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 and all yeah. these things. And then I kind of circled back to your book to go, hey, look, let's, what happened if we blow this apart and we, we deconstruct it all again, we build from these con constituent parts. And that's exactly what I got from, from this book, which is like, actually, if I remix these things, actually, if I try this thing, what happens if I do a jobs to be done thing at the beginning? So I really understand yeah. what, what users are needing and what they're really trying to accomplish, the progress they're making. And yeah, so that's, um, and also that corporate side as well. It works really well in a startup, but actually, my God, yeah, five days collapsing someone's diary, their calendar for five days. Come oh, on, it's never that, was, that was a real uphill battle. It was a real uphill. Probably one of the best th compromises we got to in constant contact was if we did enough prep. So if we did enough prep work the week before uh, in in pieces, so we sort of you know, almost it was like two and a half to three weeks. Um, you do whatever research and prep work. You're you're and you pretty much get the, everyone's calendars from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then you let the designers and a couple others do the prototyping on Thursday. And then you cherry pick who wants to come in on, like maybe the interviews go off in like pairs on Friday. So you don't have everyone, not everyone does every interview. Um, and then you bring everyone back on Friday afternoon to say, all right, interviews are done. Let's sort of review the transcripts and, and videos and kind of do some synthesis and next steps. And then maybe you might do like some other follow on the following week of like, all right, we've, these are our action items coming out of this. What are we going to take next, etc. cetera. Um, that was a format that we finally were able to like, okay, it's three days of six hours. So you like, hey, come in, get your, get your, you know, do your morning work or whatever. Don't show up till 10 o'clock. 
uh, and then you're done before four every day um, to go back in your, your quote unquote day job. Um, so we were able to do that and convince a good amount of people to, to give up that um, as long as they had some of that space um, to handle other things. Um, yeah. The way that I've seen the design sprint bubble, if you like, kind of really blow up over the last couple of years has been moving much more towards higher fidelity things that really look and feel like they're finished higher fidelity yeah. prototypes and sometimes a design sprint i think people are buying rather than buying a learning and a testing kind of learning about what works what doesn't work learning yeah. uh, invalidating people are almost buying a kind of a, a designed solution it seems mm. uh, and I, i'm not sure whether that's certain people in the market that are kind of uh, pushing those kind of things but i think the question here that i have is from your experience is there a level of uh, fidelity or uh, look and feel of prototyping that is kind of um, i don't know the best or like is there a point where you get less less um learning happening because it's almost too much or or anything like yeah. that too, too, too polished yeah sure i can talk about that um I, I think part of it is also like what is your goal what, what are you really trying to accomplish right so if you understand if you have clear goal for your sprint like what are we really trying to do here is it that we want to come out with a prototype uh or is it they want to learn something and the the best ones are where your goal is accelerated learning it's ultimately what it is most prototypes in a design sprint get thrown away um i rarely have seen a design sprint from a uh, a prototype from a design sprint get built immediately into a product there's always some iteration um in my experience from like level of fidelity, I have seen prototypes that are like literally paper prototypes um, and they can do really well. Again, it's what was their goal? Does the prototype match the goal? So I think that's part of it is the way you need to, to tackle it is saying, what is my goal here? What am I trying to learn? What am I trying to do or trying to accomplish? And then make a prototype fidelity decision that will help you reach that goal versus Hey, we're going to make this prototype, right? Oh, does it happen to fit our goal or not? Like, oh, we need to make this high fill. I know that the tooling, design tooling has become very robust and you can spin up really nice looking prototypes really fast. Yeah. There is a danger to that if something is too polished and too finished, especially in a, a sprint. So you got to find that balance of like, when you're testing it with a, a prospective customer or a user, um, they have to, you know, get a sense that there's some thinking and some thought and like, oh, that I can actually, there, there's some re realness to this, right? Otherwise they're going into the land of make-believe a little too much, which might actually, you know, taint, uh, change how they interact with it. And you may not learn what you want to learn. Um, and versus, you know, it's, it's too, it's too polished versus it's not polished enough, right? Too polished. They're like, oh, you know, okay. Yeah, whatever. Uh, if it's not polished enough, then they might even take you seriously. Like, well, I don't quite know what you're looking at here. I don't, I don't, this is a bunch of gray boxes and arrows. They don't tell me anything, right? So you got to find that balance. Um, and that's going to vary per, you know, so this is a classic, it depends answer, but again, <laughs> match it up to what you, what is your goal? And yeah. right. And like I said, with, with digital prototypes these days, you can make them look really slick really quickly. So you can build something really awesome from a prototype in a day. Um, but be mindful that match it up to what your goal is, right? Match, match the method of your goal. <clears throat> I think that's such good advice. And it comes back to so many other areas of the work that we do, right? Understanding the objective, what is it you're looking to achieve? Work backwards from that, yeah. outcomes first, if you like. Right. Um, and that being such a, such a key part of that. One of the, uh, me, the kind of happy medium that I've got to now, I think, is um, when I'm ever, whenever I'm running a design sprint for a client, I will design something which um, actually looks quite elegant and beautiful, but it's black and white. There's no branding. There's very simple animation, simple kind of look. But yeah. it, in some ways, it's harder, right? Because actually, you can you can throw on color and like beautiful round edges and corners and all the rest of it and, and placement of things, and that can mask some of what you're really looking for, particularly if you're trying to understand whether the concept mm -hmm. is of any value for people rather than the, you know, full aesthetics, but it's actually harder sometimes to make something minimal rather than kind of throwing it all. all mm -hmm. at oh yeah, it, it is actually sometimes you, <laughs> it's so easy to design something so high fidelity and it looks, looks beautifully polished, right? And this is where like the UX versus UI, right? You can have something that looks beautiful and the UI looks wonderful, amazing and, and gorgeous. 
But then you start to use it, you're like, huh, I have to get to seven clicks to do this. And uh, yeah. why is this button here? This is not actually a really primary call to action what I'm trying to do right now. Like I've definitely seen plenty of apps like that um, and prototypes that, that same way. Um, probably one of the, like when I go back to think about some of the prototypes that the students made, um, one of them for the Estrella Dam product. So Estrella Dam is a um, beer company in Spain. And what this student group did was they wanted to create a particular bar experience. And so they took their work group and they basically did like cardboard and paper prototyping of like how they could create this experience of, I don't think Estrella, like they had like, you know, different bars would have, um, you know, carry either Estrella or they could carry the other main brand like Mao. And I think what they wanted to do is say, hey, we're actually, our, all right, we're trying to prototype this concept of like the Estrella pub. Like it's a kind of like a concept store that like a, a, a right. brand might do like, you know, like, hey, what, you know, Apple has its concept flagship concept store. You can buy it online and there are other places you might, might be able to buy some of their devices, but you still have their, their flagship store. They wanted to have like, their, their suggestion was like a bunch of those around Spain and like some of the big cities and like, all right, what would this look like? How, would, how can we prototype it? And so this is what they did. And I was like, what a clever idea taking their work room and turning it into this bar and sort of like, yeah, this would be where somebody would come in. This is where the beers would be served. They could actually have kind of a self-serve here. This is where they would check ID, blah, blah, blah. It was, it was clever. It was, it was clever, awesome. but it was That's super low cool. fidelity, but it got them to, you know, the level yeah. of prototype got them to what they needed to learn. I, I'm absolutely stealing that, by the way. I'm working with a beer company, like in two weeks' time. I've got that already. That's that's noted. I'm taking it. <laughs> nice. Do it. Do it. It was it was it was super cool. But those, those are some of the fun things that, like, yeah. And I think today also a lot of the things like Miro, Miro, all the uh, whimsical, like pick your favorite whiteboard tool. Those are great for collaboration in in real time and in virtual environments, right? Where I think a lot of the stuff that I started this years ago was like everyone get in a room. Um, and I think it does change the dynamic a little bit. I've done obviously way, way, way more in-person design terms than I have. It's probably like, a, you know, 80, 20, 90, 10 in terms of a percentage <laughs> between the two. But I've done, I've done probably a, a dozen or so more um, virtual ones in the last few years. And... Um, they, they are a little bit different, like just mm -hmm. because it, of the nature of them, but um, you can still get a lot, a lot done. Um, sometimes it's, it's even just using the asynchronous time. Um, you can be like, hey, we're going to like, you know, when you have like the heads down time or drawing or ideation, be like, hey, you know what? Just come back tomorrow, like do some of this asynchronously and just by, by 10 o'clock tomorrow, make sure you've done some of these six ups or eight or whatever, whatever exercises and you've thrown them onto the mirror board and we'll come back and talk about them. So you can kind of take that, like when you need to be together and discuss versus when you need to be um, separate and doing uh, ideation or thinking, et cetera. So you can play with the calendar in that, in that regard as well. Yeah. I love that. I, I, actually, I'll have to share, uh, share something with you afterwards. Um, I haven't got time to go into it too much detail, but what I've done is, is built a lot of experience on top of Miro with um, a lot of kind of architectural elements and kind of this nice. feeling of going into different spaces and different creative spaces. We've got things that, that are almost like, a, well, a Burning Man, version of Burning Man on Miro, nice. where you can get really creative and kind of really think about things that are, you know, all over the place and whatever else. But I'll share a couple of those with you. I would love to. Yeah, I'd love to see them. That'd be great. Yeah, and most of my stuff now, most of the stuff that I do is remote. And, um, and actually, I'm becoming now... Um, I guess it's like remote first, so we, we can still do things in person, but we're still using mm -hmm. these tools, using Miro and whatever else, because um, I think that can bring so much more. Um, but I'm now at the point where I can, I feel like I can do, people come up with more, better ideas, even remotely through really carefully crafted experiences and facilitation, as well as additional, making the use of the technology, augmenting mm -hmm. you know, that process with the technology rather than it being- Yeah, for sure. Or, you, you can you can give that space for them to go do it too as well right, right? Like, that's the other thing about it is that like sometimes you know i, I would do this when we were in person and be like look go go outside go to another go to another room like sit down and just you know think through things or if you need somebody there go pair off with somebody and just jam jam in a, in a conference with somebody else on your ideas and then come back right do this exercise so there's there there's some there's some great things that remote can bring that in person can't uh so yeah. there's definitely some fun things but uh yeah, yeah. 
yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm interested to see how, uh, what you've built, that should be pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. I'll share that for sure. Hey, no worries. I'm, I'm, I'm really keen where we are rap and this is amazing so far, rapidly running, running towards that hour point. So I really would love to, to really kind of unpick your, um, some of these challenges, I think that we constantly have, say, say mm -hmm. for example, we're running a design sprint and what often happens, I feel is that you do this great stuff. You kind of, depending on who you are and what your experience been and what the partnership of this looks like. Yeah. Sometimes the, the prototype gets thrown over the wall or a report and some kind of validation or learning kind of gets thrown over and then people catch it or they don't, but it falls away and the execution yeah. can often just evaporate. Right. And the, and the projects can, uh, it's like you need to bring breathe oxygen into these projects mm -hmm. again to get them going, re restarted and going again. I'm interested in kind of transitioning to, to that part of the execution particularly and and trying to start to unpick, I guess, some of the work you've done around roadmaps and the book product roadmaps re, uh, relaunched. Yeah. And, and, and just kind of understand how you go about that next phase, if you like, of executing once you've kind of got to the point of validating, at least to, ex to an extent, some of the desirability side of things. People want this thing. It seems to add value. But how do you get to the next point of going, right, we're really able to capture value now? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things, so I'll, I'll start with the first Thursday night. It's a big, right big topic for 10 minutes. By yeah, the way. yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll share a story from the first design sprint I ran at Constant Contact. Um, uh, we, you know, we took about a, a week ahead of time to do some preparation and some secondary research and market. Uh, there was a project that was that was kind of floating around, and I think it had some executive sponsorship, or like maybe it was an executive pet project, but it didn't quite like. It, it wasn't really going anywhere. I don't know, like if somebody just held on to it because they they had they liked the idea and they they kind of had a promise, but there was nobody had like it just wouldn't die basically. <laughs> And I think they like one executive wanted to go put a lot of money into it. And I think others were like, oh, I don't know if we have any evidence. So they gave it to us and they're like, Hey, do something with this, right? Um, either, either spin it up or kill it. Like, and it was kind of like, a, all right, well, let's see what we can do. Like, great. So we ran a design sprint, did enough, you know, preparation, ran the sprint. And afterwards we literally like killed ourselves the week after writing this like 56 page report like detailing out our findings from the market side, our findings from the, from the design sprint. And I think, and then we sent it around and I think maybe five people read that thing, like from, you know, if that three of them being us. So it was just a total waste of a week of our time to write that entire detailed report. In one sense, it was good. It, it, it was a nice artifact that encapsulated what we did, had our recommendations, had a lot of evidence baked into it. And like, wow, we've never seen anything like this here. So in some sense, it was good because it opened people's eyes to a level of rigor and process and um, decision making that hadn't existed necessarily in the, the product team at, at Constant Contact. But it was like, oh my God, do we actually have to write a 50 whatever page report? No, we probably could have done an executive summary and sent that out and then listed like, here's all our other artifacts if you want the details, right? Because um, ultimately we, we ended up shutting it down. It was this, this loyalty card thing they wanted to do that just didn't make sense for Constant Contact at the time, even though it kind of, it, yeah, anyways. So it just got killed. Um, but there are other projects that like, oh, there's something here. Let's, how do we get this to, to move forward? Um, and I think, I'm trying to think of a couple of examples where this happened. Um, we did one with a, um, with a, a team that was actually, they're working with an external company as well. Like a, another startup kind of worked with them on this, um, sort of like a do it for me kind of model that we were bringing into constant contact. Uh, cause most, most of constant contact was like, Hey, you know, here's your email marketing platform, have at it. And we'll give you some coaching and some help and some templates. And then again, this was like 2012, 2013. And there was a, a thought of like, Hey, actually there are plenty of small business marketing consultants. Could we actually build or make a product that does some of this marketing for them? Um, with rather than, cause these people were like, you know, coffee shop owners, nonprofits, they, they were businesses that were under 10 people. 
So they didn't go into this business to be a marketer. They went to this business to be a lawyer, a flower shop, a nonprofit. Like they had a mission, not, and it wasn't, a, and marketing was like a thing they had to do to keep their business afloat versus I'm doing these other things that I'm really good at and oh, I have to learn how to be a marketer to do this, right? So could we offer a service to them that went beyond the $50 a month email campaign where they had to do everything? It's like, hey, would you pay us like 100 or 200 bucks a month or 300 bucks a month and we can do half of this for you or 90% of it for you? It started to get some traction. Um, so we, we, we had this sort of thing of like, what happens after the sprint? We call them jump starts internally of like, all right, you did a sprint. Now, um, yes? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so you did a sprint and then um, uh, what, what was the thing you have to do afterwards? And so it was like, yeah, you still have to continue to do a little bit of validation, a little bit of iteration and a little bit of learning. And so we, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do like another sprint. What we would do is say, okay, let's, let's schedule in, you know, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we've kind of do some, all right, what happens on Monday? We do, you know, what, what are the new experiments and new things we need to validate? Um, okay. Check in on Wednesday or Thursday for any prototyping, uh, Friday, do, have we lined up any interviews and do that? And we try to do, you know, something like that for like either with over one or two weeks, like another, we call it iteration or jumpstart, I think. Um, and so we try to do a couple of those afterwards to go, okay, yeah, now we have a lot more validation. We have a lot more verification. Um, we would even start to pull in more marketing weight to say, Hey, can you, we've got some, can you do some surveying, like pull a list of 500 customers and send them this survey and get more quantitative data behind it. Right. So now it was, you know, you're only talking to what, five, 10 people in a design sprint, um, to get qualitative validation and this was like okay now we start to move towards more quantitative verification of like okay this is real we can start to get pricing price testing here and so ultimately they did a few of those and we, we this thing started to to get off the ground of and actually become a, a product that i think before i left the thing was you know we ended up get, making like 150 200 000 a year roughly um and it was really like two people kind of running the show um mostly with this other uh, other startup so it was it you know it it, it grew into a product over time, but we had to continue to do those reps and iterations uh, along the way. It makes so much sense. You know, I think one of the things I kind of think about is how can we give this thing more life? How can we give where they're at more life? And, and what we've started to do now is um, essentially kind of like, uh, like product coaching, I guess you'd call it, like, you know, weekly or whatever it is. A, and maybe a tail off, so do a few things every other day or whatever else after the initial sprint, but then some kind of weekly calls just to just to recalibrate, see how things are going. And, and I find that when I'm working directly with a product manager that's trying to implement some of the things after a design sprint, then those kind of weekly touch points or something like that can really work just to just to give that fresh eyes, fresh perspective and keep things top of mind for people uh, and enable them to kind of, yeah, keep on testing just because you've done a design sprint, that doesn't mean you can take the validation done. box. <laughs> no, you're not done. You're not done at all. You know, and then, and then from there, like, okay, now do you have enough information and in, in validation to start to at least craft some kind of forward roadmap? And that's actually how we wrote the roadmap book. We had, at, I was working at Fresh Old Soil with Richard. So I left Cosmic, joined him, his team. And me and this other strategist were, we kept getting this question from our our clients, like, We'd run a design sprint or one of these jumps. I think we call them different things um, at Freshold Soil. But we run like one of the design sprints and iterations or jump starts, and then we're like, okay, now what? Uh, and so they kept saying, asking us, now what? And so I think Evan started to do a, a couple of roadmap exercises for them and, and start to say, okay, well, here's here's based on what we know, let's map this out, let's put a framework together of, okay, what are your next steps here to try to roadmap out what this product would look like over the next, I don't know, six to twelve months, depending on what the client needed. And ultimately that turned into road mapping workshops um, <laughs> that, that ultimately turned into uh, me, Evan, and getting in touch with Bruce McCarthy and be like, hey, is there a book here? Um, <laughs> I was like, I know a publisher. I've already done this once. Should we try it again? And then we kind of did the, is anybody else done this? Like, there's got to be a book somewhere on this. And we started looking and Google was like, okay, there's a chapter in this book on road mapping. There's a chapter in that book on road mapping nobody's actually got a book dedicated to this, huh? And then the whole voice in our head is like, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? And yeah. so then we, all right. Uh, so then we, we just went interviewed like 50, 
50, 60 different, actually, no, we ended up with like maybe 80 or so different product teams and as input. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So. And, it, and it's become like, that's it. I, I'm, I don't know for sure, but it seems like that's been a enormous success for you. And um, I'm conscious of time and I'm wondering, hey, <laughs> I've really enjoyed, I, I wonder whether there's another, whether maybe we should do a round two. Maybe we should yeah, do a round two. Yeah, maybe we can do round two, sure. Deep dive. <laughs> yeah, we can do a deep dive in that afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Re, uh, the Product Romans for Lunch is probably the most successful book that we've written. And I think it's what O'Reilly told me at least uh, a year or so ago was that it was the second best selling product book they had behind Melissa Perry's Build Trap, um, wow. which is really a, an honor and humbling to, yeah. to know. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. It's probably worth a whole other 40 minutes of chat. <laughs> I think so. I would love that. I, it's been yeah. an amazing, uh, amazing time talking to you. Um, yeah. I'm keen that we finish off with with something that you can leave anyone with. Um, you know, if people want to get in touch with you, if if there's anything else that you want to share as well, do do yeah. let us know. Now. I haven't got the biggest audience, but hey, if anyone That's is okay. listening right now. This is where you can get hold of uh, uh, see in the future. Or, or yeah, out. yeah. You can always find me on Twitter right now, though. Hopefully Twitter's not not dead yet, but I am C Todd on Twitter or hello at ctodd.com is a very simple and easy email to remember. Uh, if you want to ping me with, with questions or whatever, I'm always happy to chat. Um, but yeah, when it comes to like design spirits and getting your idea, like there's a level of be okay with you might be wrong, right? Like it's not about the idea. It's about the value the idea creates and, and sort of focus on that and the, out, the sort of goals and outcomes versus the idea itself. Um, and that's design sprints tries to help with that. So, yeah. Yeah. What is that expression? Um, build yeah. like you're right. Test like you're wrong. Exactly. Um, I love yeah, that phrase. I love that. Yeah, 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 cool. absolutely. Well, see, Todd, thank you so much, uh, for yeah. spending the time with us this morning. My um, pleasure. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Uh, we've got a bank holiday this week, this weekend, cause, uh, our, Enjoy. our king, king is, uh, is being, um, uh, whatever they do it's all coordinated yeah 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 okay right weekend here nice. hopefully you have a great weekend as well and uh I look forward to hopefully around two sometime